Queensland's don't trust the government and the media. Two thirds. That is a huge amount of people who don't have trust in. And that this these figures came from the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer survey in 2018. It's consistent. We do not trust the government or the media. And why the media? Because these sorts of meta narratives. They will tell you these journalists who a lot are quite authentic in I'm sure they're just brainwashed and indoctrinated a lot of the majority of people. They might might be wanting to do you know a service for their Australian community. However, the meta narratives, the big picture stuff like money and banking, like how the system has been scammed, is incorporated because it's guess what? The media is run by multi billionaires who will stand to lose if this information gets out to society. So it takes the little people like me, buddy, sitting behind my computer in my office, trying to get this information out there. The media, you've been called out. You need to start talking about these sorts of things very, very quickly if we want to move forward in an honourable fashion for our Australian communities. digital currencies and that, that whole subject I just finished a book on that called banking and the people so I did go step by step into all this wonky stuff and and how we what the alternatives are for fixing it or proposals are and which would work and which wouldn't and I agree that gold is not going to work it didn't I mean we were on a gold standard for centuries and it it always resulted in booms and busts and booms and busts because there's a limited amount of gold and so, I mean, you could see it really clearly if you go back to actually using gold coins. If that was the only thing available and you lend out 10 coins and you want 11 coins back, obviously you're going to wind up with somebody's going to going to wind up in default and then they're going to wind up in debt slavery. And, you know, the system just can't be sustained um, now that we get around it and all these with all this slate of hand and that's what that's what I wrote about the repo market is was a big issue in 2008 and it's still a big issue it's I mean it's gonna it could well collapse again but I won't try to get into that but yeah so we do have good models and in the US we have one we only have one publicly owned bank and that's the Bank of North Dakota or state owned bank Bank of North Dakota but it's been around for a hundred years uh, the Wall Street Journal also had an article about it in 2014 that said that um, the Bank of North Dakota is more profitable than J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs. And the reason is just its business model that they have lower costs. They don't have high paid CEOs and um, they don't have shareholders sucking out profits. They don't have to have a lot of branches because they actually partner with the local banks. So the local banks are acting sort of as the front office and the Bank of North Dakota is more like a banker's bank where they're big to put 98% of their deposits come from the state itself and from public entities. So they take that money and use it as deposits and then leverage it into local below market loans into the community. And they, if the, if a local bank needs help, like they, it's a loan that they couldn't take themselves, then the Bank of North Dakota will step in with this cheap liquidity and help them with it. So it's a, it's a very viable model, but it was it wasn't really much known, I think, until I started writing about it in uh, 2008. I knew they were the only state that had their own bank, so I was watching it, and it turned out they were the only state that escaped the credit crisis. Like they never went into the into the red. And they had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, the lowest foreclosure rate. So there was there was clearly something about the state that was doing really well. I mean, some people have called it, said it was due to oil. They do have oil. But the oil boom didn't really hit in North Dakota until 2010. And they were already reporting record profits. And they just reported, even when we had an oil bust, you know, several years ago. I think it was like right after the 2014. And although the government itself was, you know, struggling, the Bank of North Dakota year after year after year reported record profits, the higher profits than the year before. So the bank model is an excellent model. And but then globally we have things like the Sparkassen banks in Germany, which are those are local banks that take individual deposits and they mostly cater to local businesses. I mean, they're very local. They're not allowed to lend outside their local community. 
and then they they sort of share resources and um, they the the Landis Bank is I can't say that right, but anyway, there's there are bigger banks that are part of their system. Anyway, they it's due to the Spark Hazard Banks and KFW, which is a public development bank that uh, they have become the leader in renewable energies in the in the world. That was that was how they. So these are loans that um, normal commercial banks are afraid to make because they don't want to venture into something new and something that might be risky. But a public bank will do it. So anyway, that's worked out very well for them. China has 80% of their banks are publicly owned. And you know, you can't quite, I mean, it's amazing what they've done in the last 20 years. They've just, they had 10% growth every year right up till through 2008. I mean, it's slowed up now because they're, the whole global market is going down, but they're still, I think at 7% or something, they're still doing really well. Um, so anyway, there are many models, some of them not as good as others, you know, some are, the public banks did have a reputation for being sort of um, corrupt, like in the 20th century when you couldn't really track things like you can now, but now we have the potential for total transparency and total accountability. So if you baked into these banks, right into their charters, that they have to do certain things and they have to serve the public interest, then, and if you can see their books and you can see when they haven't done that, you can either get rid of the politicians that, um, you know, that were responsible or get rid of the people running the bank that were responsible. Anyway, they, we, we don't have any leverage over private banks, even if we know they're doing corrupt things, what can we, or if we know they're not serving the, the local community, what can we do about it? They don't have any mandate to serve the local community. Their mandate is to make short-term profits for their shareholders, and that's it. And in fact, if they had a choice between like a big um, five billion dollar some sort of hedge fund loan and a fifty thousand dollar small business loan, they will always take the hedge fund loan. Because it's much, you know, it's the same amount of work to check and see that <laughs> they probably already know the client. They know that the client's a good pay. Um, so it's a less work to do the $5 billion loan. They're going to make more money off it. Um, even though the little $50,000 loan for the business was a perfectly good loan. I mean, that's the type of, the type of loan that the spark doesn't make would make because that's, that's what they do. That's their specialty. So it's quite profitable to do those little loans. But the big banks are required to make big loans for big profits because, because of their short shareholder model. I just want to reiterate what I said leading into the interview is that we need a balance between the public and private spectrum, between the left and right spectrum. That's just reality. That's how reality works in general. It needs to be applied on all levels in our personal life and in our social system design. So when, the, when Ellen spoke around uh, China, and there's a fears around communism, around public banking, all the rest of it. I think you really um, uh, dispelled those fears but quite simply is when you design anything, of course it can be corrupted. You need to encode particular safeguards and mechanisms to ensure the corruption isn't, isn't um, a part of that particular model. And so having the accountability and the transparency, maybe incorporating blockchain technologies, decentralized accounting ledger technologies into public banks is an absolute, uh, absolutely important uh, strategy to make sure they cannot be corrupted. But that's the same with government, it's the same with corporations, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. Anything be can be corrupted, um, but it can be uh, circumnavigated through proper design. Now, what I want to uh, just reiterate is something that uh, Ellen spoke about the media. That is, that in Australia, two thirds of Australians don't trust the government and the media. Two thirds. That is a huge amount of people who don't have trust in. And that this these figures came from the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer Survey in 2018. It's consistent. We do not trust the government or the media. And why the media? Because these sorts of meta narratives, they will tell you these journalists who a lot are quite authentic in I'm sure they just brainwash and indoctrinate a lot of the majority of people. 
they want, might be wanting to do you know, a service for their Australian community. However, the meta narratives, the big picture stuff like money and banking, like how the system has been scammed is incorporated because it's, guess what? The media is run by multi-billionaires who will stand to lose if this information gets out to society. So it takes the little people like me, buddy, sitting behind my computer in my office trying to get this information out there. The media, you've been called out. You need to start talking about these sorts of things very, very quickly if we want to move forward in an honourable fashion for our Australian communities. But ultimately what I'm getting at is the narrative is shifting very deeply on all these matters. And we need to try and get to the cutting edge of where we're going because the Australians are very susceptible to a housing market crash at the moment and our own crash. We did not go through this in 2008. We are very vulnerable right now when it comes to this interconnected global banking and monetary system and any hiccup in bloody Germany or it doesn't matter where, we are going to suffer dramatically. And so what we need to do is safeguard ourselves against any national or global monetary bloody meltdowns or even just hiccups. And how we safeguard ourselves is localization. Localization, as I mentioned before, food and resource creation, um, using the public postal network. I'm not sure if you've heard about this, Ellen, but using the Australia Post Network or the USPS, the US Postal Service, um, to incorporate, uh, and actually, you, of course you have, because you have written about banking being incorporated within the Postal Service Network, which I read just recently, but we could also incorporate communication infrastructure into those that public postal network. The reason being we need software and hardware publicly owned is because we've, we've got a real serious issue around censorship versus free speech right now. The big tech from Silicon Valley are censoring um, uh, particular ideological viewpoints. And the government are doing the, sorry, not the government, the people who have hijacked our bloody governments are uh, uh, enforcing this sort of uh, censorship. Absolutely um, disgraceful for the, uh, for the people of Australia and the world. But not only that, the dinosaur ma mainstream media, they, of course, uh, um, have been censoring these meta-narratives that I talked about earlier for a long, long time. So we've got a very poorly informed Australian public. Hence the need to transition the Australia Post Network to the digital age. It was originally designed to ensure that uh, the freedom and free flow of information could occur and that if there was any dictatorship type government happening, the people have still got a mechanism to communicate with each other through their postal network to make sure that they stop any, you know, sort of issues arising in the government, right? That's what it was originally, that's part of its original mandate. And it needs to be um, transitioned to the digital, digital age to make sure that we can circumnavigate censorship and we have the ability to communicate freely with each other through our own software packages and hardware packages. So I know all that's a mouthful. Ellen, thank you for staying with me through all that. We need to localise. We need to safeguard ourselves against this crazy scam, this money and banking scam that's on a global scale right now. We need to protect ourselves from that through the, all those localization mechanisms I just spoke of, how do you see us protecting ourselves from what's going on in the global, um, this global debt bubble, this, the, the big, I think they call it the, um, the meta bubble, bubble, the mega bubble. But the, how do we protect ourselves through not just the localization mechanisms, but also the money supply? What would you say the, the smartest thing the people of Australia should demand from their government in terms of Australia National Bank um, or an Australian National Bank or the ANB, which I've, I've sort of been calling it lately, um, but also local public banking networks, also this uh, MMT, sovereign monetary currency system that we could potentially design. Lay out your wisdom for us, Ellen, because I want to make sure that, uh, that we really um, start circulating this through the Australian community. Well, I love your point about that the post office was originally de designed for free speech or for communication. I, I'll write about that. <laughs> That's a good topic for an article. Um, yeah, so, so we've had postal banks in, in the U.S. We had a postal bank from 1911 to 1967. So the postal bank system, the public, in other words, you call it a postal, and people think that's like something different from a bank. But it was a national public banking system, which we had for all those years 
and it was very popular in the 1930s when all the private banks were going bankrupt. So people rushed to the postal banking system because it was backed by the government. It paid 2% interest, which was a very good return at the time. And, um, and the private banks were, you know, very risky. But the government, instead, of course, they were the big bank lobbyists leaning on them. Instead of propping up the postal bank, or let's just call it the public banking system that we then had, they actually capped the public banking system so that they couldn't raise their interest rates, that they backed the private banks with FDIC insurance. So we, the people, suddenly were on the hook for the deposits of private banks that could then, had no obligation to use that power of taking in deposits and leveraging them into loans. They had no obligation to use that in the public interest, where the public system obviously would have. Um, and we, so we had to back their defaults. And, the, and, and so that's where we are today. So in 1967, the postal banks were discontinued because they were, at that point, they were no longer competitive with the private banks, which did raise the interest rates they were paying to depositors and the postal banks couldn't, couldn't do it. And they weren't allowed to make big business type loans. So anyway, all the way along, we've been hamstrung by big lobbyists that, as you say, it's not the government, it's not our government, it no longer is our government, it's a government run by big business and big money. And so the real challenge is how do we get it back? But I, but I would say what we need is a, a, a public banking system at all levels. We need to turn the Federal Reserve into a true public utility, which means we need to change the way it is governed uh, you need to change the law on the way it is governed. Our Federal Reserve, we have 12 Federal Reserve branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their district. And they obviously have the biggest voice in how monetary policy is done. The uh, Federal Open Market Committee meets behind closed doors and the heads of five, five heads of the banks of these privately owned banks are, um, are on the committee along with seven um, people from the federal government. So anyway, they have a very strong voice and who knows what happens behind closed doors. So we need to get all that out in the public and uh, we need to have the public represented on, represented on those boards. So if you had a public bank, this public central bank actually doing quantitative easing in a different way, the way they did it so far, the money only went to the reserve accounts of banks. And then at the same time, the Federal Reserve dropped interest rates almost to zero. So both the banks and their big corporate um, customers could make, could borrow very cheaply. So they were the ones that bought up all the assets. They bought the stocks, they bought the houses, drove up the price, inflated the prices of assets. And the money did not get into the real real economy, the productive economy, where people work, where people get paid, where people get the money to pay off their loans, and um, of course, where they shop. So if we had a, a central bank that was mandated to serve the public interest by such things as perhaps a national dividend, also known as the universal basic income, or um, building infrastructure, or education, I mean, there are many things we could do in the public interest in the same way that they bailed out the banks we could bail out the public, get some money out there in people's pockets. So you'd, ha you'd have a federal level public bank, state level public banks that could be similar to like KFW and the infrastructure banks that, um, that focus on infrastructure and business loans, that type of thing. And then you could have the postal bank, postal banking system to take individual deposits, make individual loans, I would say backed by the, by the central bank because you need that source of liquidity. To, uh, and there are actually some academic proposals to that effect right now that, that we, we should all be able to bank at the central bank. In other words, we all should be able to have, a, have an account there. Right now the banks are getting 2.4% interest on their federal reserve, on their reserves, which are their deposits. And we're getting 0.1% on average, so almost nothing. So we, the people, could be participating in that system. Anyway, I have to, so I just finished a book on that whole subject called Banking on the People, where 
you know, I go through the whole thing step by step and look at all the alternatives and make some proposals. Excellent. So if I was to summarise it like this, the government needs to stop lending out um, to the private market so it's got private debt, needs to stop that completely, create an Australian National Bank, um, uh, merge the Reserve Bank of Australia with the Australian National Bank instead of having this monetary policy process, focus on fiscal policy process maybe, and then go to the state levels, have state banks that manage the state economies um, and have the local public banking, which you might do through the postal network, um, but also you could create proper institutions, I guess, as well, um, make it competitive within the market as well to make sure that the banking system is kept honest. And all of the creation um, of that, all the money that comes from money creation is managed locally and reinvested within community infrastructure, social programs, and also to make sure our societies uh, are serviced properly, um, education, health, um, but also um, to, to, to resolve these deep socioeconomic issues that we have like homelessness, entrenched poverty, drug addiction, uh, domestic violence, ma mass, massive amounts of sickness, stress, sadness and sickness throughout our society. We've got a lot of problems. We've got to sort these out. Is that the general model that we should be thinking about? Right. I didn't quite hear. You said at the beginning that not making private loans, I, I didn't quite follow who you were saying. So instead of the government owing um, money to private stakeholders. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yes. Yes, agreed. Totally. Um, right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> no, that's okay. So what, what it was, is that, 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 is, that, that, is, that, is that more or less a good summary for what Australia should do to protect ourselves from this global crap that's going on um, in terms of the scamming and start re-empowering um, the people and the communities to take care of themselves and manage their own affairs. Right. Okay. I just remember what I was going to say. So, uh, the, so the focus has been on regulating the banks. You know, glass, de reimposing glass steagall, etc. Um, but that hasn't worked, and it, they always manage to get around it. They can come up with uh, things like the repo market or whatever that they can come up with things faster. They're their engineered products faster than than politicians who are very slow can get around to regulating. But if you set up a public system, so so that my argument would be set up a, a better mousetrap and just let it work and let the private banks do their thing. If you want a bank at a private bank, that's perfectly fine. But the public bank is going to be safer and it's going to give you a better interest rate. So the, the private bank system would just fade by attrition, it seems to me, or you could make private banks, you know, offer them to be part of the public system. All they have to do is make their books uh, public and, you know, they, instead of having private shareholders, they, they could, uh, anyway, it, it seems to me that we need to focus on the better model and just work to develop that model. And instead of trying to regulate a bad model that if you tweak it one way then you then you do something that hurts another area i mean you can't tell what what effect your actions are going to have so better to just, just start with some local public banks that's what we're trying to do in the u.s that would start small just to prove the model when you can see that they are profitable and that they're um you know doing doing good things for the local community then expand and move more money into them and just gr gradually pr prove the whole system by the better mousetrap. Well, we might not have time for that, Ellen. You don't know when the next bloody uh, global financial meltdown is going to occur, um, it's, <laughs> whether, or not it's, whether or not it's orchestrated or not. We've got the solutions there. You're absolutely right, though. Um, of course, we need the separation of commercial and investment banking, which is the Glass-Steagall Act. In fact, there was a bill put into Parliament here in Australia just recently regarding that process. So that is on the table here in Australian politics. But ultimately, um, of course, people are going to want to bank with a public bank if they get better interest rates. But not only that, the money goes back into their communities and helps their fellow Australians. So you'd have to be, um, you know, just out in the in the in the bloody clouds not to want to do that, which will make sure that these private banking industries 
and cartels are behaving honourably. That'll keep them honest. That'll keep that'll get them behaving in in better ways. So, Ellen, um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, if where can people follow your work, and is there anything additional that you'd like to contribute to this conversation? Um. Well, I, I, sorry, I had a button, no, I forgot, didn't tell you. Um, okay, I'll just, my website is ellenbrown.com and um, the Public Banking Institute is publicbankinginstitute.org. My three books on this subject are Web of Debt, Public Bank Solution, and my new one coming out is called Banking on the People. And I love how naturally happy and organic you are. Um, you, you, it's a, always a pleasure to interview <laughs> Ellen. Um, thank you so much for your time again today. And uh, I will uh, I look forward to our next time. Likewise. Thank you very much.